I'm Dom Nichols, and this is Ukraine The Latest. Today, we examine the implications of Ukraine cutting off Russian troops in Kursk by destroying three bridges, and hear from GP Now, the hospital in the cloud for Ukrainians impacted by the war. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. The first duty of my government is security and defence, to make clear our unshakable support of NATO and with our allies towards Ukraine. Keep stand strong. Nobody is going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. It's Monday, the 19th of August, two years and 182 days since the full-scale invasion began. Today, I'm joined by foreign correspondent Verity Bowman, Brussels correspondent Joe Barnes, and Rob Hicken and Spencer Cash of GP Now. I started with updates from the battlefronts in Ukraine and Russia. Well, hi, folks. Welcome to Ukraine The Latest, a podcast and Twitter space on the war in Ukraine. My name is Dom Nichols. I'm a journalist here in the Telegraph a newspaper in London. Today, I'm joined by foreign correspondent Verity Bowman, Brussels correspondent Joe Barnes, and hopefully from Singapore, Rob Hicken, uh, CEO of uh, GP Now. Just having some problems with his mic. I'll keep an eye on that as we go on. But also from San Diego, Spencer Cash, also of GP Now. That's the Ukrainian hospital in the cloud. More of that a little bit later. I'm going to start with updates from the battlefronts in Ukraine and Russia. So Ukrainian forces have continued their push in Kursk Oblast over the weekend, making most advances, albeit it is small, the, the tempo of advance has slowed. I'll speak about that in a moment. Um, but most advances seem to be southeast of Sudza, the town that was first taken and consolidated. However, the big story over the weekend was the destruction by Ukraine of a number of bridges over the same river. Now, the, the area we're talking about, you've got the blob of land held by Ukraine that's been there for two weeks now. Blob is a technical term. There's an area of of Russia, of, of the region to the west of that's quite long and thin, shoebox shaped, if you like. About 30 k's long, 10 kilometers deep. 30 k's long east to west, 10 kilometers deep north to south. Now that area is bounded to the east by the by the area that, that Ukraine currently holds inside Russia. It's bounded by the border with Ukraine to the south for about, I'd say, 30 kilometers. And then the border at the far end, the 10 kilometers uh, going north at the far end, which is also bordered by the Ukrainian uh, border. Now the bit along the top, a bit running east to west for about 30 k's ish along the top, roughly from the uh, well from the Ukrainian border into where uh, Kiev's troops are currently holding ground. That area is largely or, or is accessed by a number of bridges over the same river. There's Russian forces in there. This is a large town, so if Russia want to resupply their forces by land ground line of communication and get civilians out, they need to go over these three bridges. We spoke about them briefly at the end of last week and then the news started coming in from Friday and over the weekend. Firstly, the main town in the area is Glushkovo and the bridge over the Seam River just outside the town was hit on Friday. And this came initially from Alexis Smirnov, Russia's regional acting governor. However, it's been backed up by many other credible sources over, over the weekend. That's the biggest of the three bridges, the most capable. That's about 40 k's northwest of Sudza, 10 kilometers north of the border with Ukraine. Then over the weekend, the second bridge was destroyed on, uh, well, either Saturday or Sunday, we're not sure. But Ukraine's Air Force commander, Mikhail Olyshuk, confirmed it on Sunday. That's in the town of Zavadnoi, which is about 5 k's northwest of Glushkova. And then that only left the bridge over Kariz, which is about a, a further five kilometres west from Savanoi. So in total, about seven or eight kilometres from the western border with Ukraine, if you like. Now, earlier today, an official of the Russian Investig Investigative Committee claimed in a video that bridge had been hit yesterday. That was backed up by a number of Russian mill bloggers. And there's news coming out from Ukrainian sources as well that that bridge has gone. So if all those things are, are correct, and they seem to be, that's going to isolate about 700 square kilometres of land in the border area, in that sort of shoebox area that I was just you know, badly <laughs> trying to describe. About 700 square kilometres of land. That will add to the rough, roughly 1,100 square kilometres of land in Russia that Ukrainian troops currently sit on. It will also complicate 
the evacuation of any Russian civilians from the area. And Russia's emergency committee has spoken just in or said just in the last couple of hours that so far more than 121,000 people have been evacuated since the Ukrainian incursion began. Not all from this shoe box I'm talking about, but across the Kursk region. But it just it just shows how big this evacuation operation is going to be complicated by these bridges being lost. Now, responding to this news that the third bridge may have gone and the implications, Linus Linkvisius, who's Lithuania's former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Defence Minister, and now ambassador to Sweden, he said on Twitter, he said, Russia trapped conscripts in the Kursk region surrender by the thousands because they want to live. Thousands of regular troops are about to be surrounded and nobody cares about them. Everything happens strictly according to Putin's plan, and that simply does not exist. Those are his words. Now then, the bridge, that final bridge that carries is thought to be the last permanent structure crossing the river same that leaves Moscow with very few options about bringing supplies across the water and getting people out. There are reports that uh, Russia may also have a pontoon bridge at Glushkovo, back the main town, the first bridge that went on Friday. A pontoon bridge is, is basically a, a much lower grade uh, bridge. It's in the vicinity of the, the big bridge that went up on Friday. Not suitable for heavy armour if it exists. And it looks like it does. There's a number of people commenting about this pontoon bridge, but I mean, that will not... Firstly, if it's the only route in and out think of the bottlenecks and secondly if it's a pontoon bridge which is not designed for very heavy plant and armor and all the rest of it that's not going to cut the mustard now president Zelensky, he has made a couple a few comments last week but he, he sp- said last night that the objective of ukraine's operation in kursk is to create a buffer zone he had previously said that the incursion was about protecting communities in the border Sum- bordering sumi region from constant shelling that's probably also correct However, in last night's address, he said, It is now our primary task in defensive operations overall to destroy as much Russian war potential as possible and conduct maximum counteroffensive operations. This includes creating a buffer zone on the aggressor's territory, our operation in the Kursk region. So yes, buffer zone, but I also note trying to destroy as much Russian war potential as possible and conduct maximum counteroffensive actions. Those aren't glib comments. Now, the Institute for the Study of War, the US-based think tank, citing a Wall Street Journal article from Saturday. Well, in that article from Saturday, the Wall Street Journal reporter saw said to be familiar with Ukraine's operation in Russia. They've said that Russian forces had redeployed several understrength brigades, totaling about 5,000 personnel from elsewhere in Ukraine towards Kursk, possibly including the Donetsk, so-called Donetsk People's Republic, Pyatnashka Brigade. Now, ISW also say elements of Russian, the Russian 200th Motor Rifle Brigade, which comes from the 14th Army Corps in the Leningrad Military District, also said to have arrived in Kursk late last week, or Kursk Oblast late last week. ISW say they had observed elements of that brigade fighting near Chasiv Yar in Donetsk Oblast in recent months. So I'll say again, I mentioned it last week, but we've got to be cautious here. Elements of units don't equate to the whole thing. So you've got to be very cautious about um, sites saying, well, th- this unit, this brigade has been moved from Russia into here or from occupied Ukraine up to Kursk and so on and so forth. The fact that Kyiv's forces haven't expanded their lodgment by very much in recent days, I think, is rather telling. Either they want to and are being stopped by whatever forces Russia has been able to get there or they don't want to and they're going firm they're trying to hold the ground they are transitioning to the defense in which case that tells us slightly less about what response russia has been able to mount but we've just got to be very cautious about saying oh this is an absolute cakewalk ukraine's roaming freely across curse they're up against conscripts and nothing else but we've just got to be very very cautious here we'll report what we see hopefully provide some sensible analysis and try and make sense of it together Now, elsewhere in Ukraine, there have been minimal advances by Russia in the Donbass. There have been uh, ISW geolocated very small Russian advances. I'll point you to the comments by Phillips O'Brien, Professor of War Studies at the University of St Andrews, who uh, just points out that, remember earlier this year, it was said that Putin wanted to take Chasiv Yar by May the 9th victory parade, or at least by the inauguration of his next presidential term after that stunning election victory. So, yes, there have been advances, but we've got to keep it in perspective. Um, But 
at the same time, Russia is taking ground, albeit slowly. Kiev Independent reporting today that Pokrovsk administrative head, Sergei Dobiak, speaking to Radio Free Europe slash Radio Liberty, said residents of the city of Pokrovsk have, uh, have been given a week or two to evacuate given the Russian advances in the area. Uh, Russian forces are closing in on Pokrovsk, as we've been reporting. It's an important logistical hub for Ukrainian operations in Donbass. And the Kiev Independents say about 53,000 people still remain in the city. Now, Mr Dobriak says that on average about 500 to 600 people are able to get out of the city every day and that 60% of them or 60% of the residents leave using their own means of transport. So there's a great, under great pressure there. Let's not forget. I note that our own Heathcliff O'Malley, one of our brilliant photojournalists, he said earlier on Twitter today, he said it's awful to hear of yet another town in the Donbass being forced to evacuate. In early 2023, Pakrosp was a mini success story with families moving back, kids playing in the skate park and shops reopening. But the Russians grind on turning all to ashes. Just another couple from me. Uh, Ukraine says it destroyed all 11 drones that Moscow launched overnight, including on Kyiv. This comes from the Air Force earlier today. Sumy was hit on Friday by, we think, a ballistic missile that caused death and injury there to the city. That seems to be their only real response to what's happening in Kursk. The drones that were shot down last night were hit over Mykolaiv, Cherkasy, Venitsia, Kyiv, Dnipro, Petrovsk. Kharkiv, Sumy and Donetsk regions, no reports of any damage or casualties so far. But speaking of drone fragments, they seem to be just as dangerous as the actual high explosives on the drones themselves, if you are to believe, if we are to believe Russian officials. And why do I say that? Well, in Rostov Oblast, so inside Russia, a large Russian oil depot was hit by Ukrainian drones overnight on Saturday, Sunday. This is the Proletarsk oil refinery, about 300 kilometres northeast of Kirsch, just trying to give you a flavour for where it is. Um, that was hit over the weekend, overnight Saturday, Sunday. And then this morning, there was a catastrophic series of other explosions. There's a huge, you'll find it online, a huge column of flames, hundreds of feet tall, seen rising over the depot, thick black smoke. It's, there's a lot of stuff on fire there. 18 firefighters said to be injured, state of emergency declared. But the regional governor, Russia's regional governor, said that it had been fragments from downed UAVs that set fire to fuel tanks. So there we go. Got to watch out for those uh, those sharp edges, I guess. Now then, delighted to invite back um, to the pod. I haven't heard from Verity for a little while. But Verity, uh, welcome back. You've done some brilliant work over the weekend. You were talking to uh, Russian uh, residents of, of Kursk Oblast. Um, and they say they're ready to evacuate at a moment's notice. Who are you speaking to and what were they, uh, what were they saying to you? Hi, Dom. Uh, thank you for having me on today. It's been a while. Um, yeah, so I managed to track down four different locals from the Kursk area over the last week, as well as a Ukrainian soldier who was actually part of the advance. Um, as you said, a lot of them have plans in action to um, get out of the way and evacuate as soon as possible if Ukraine continues to advance. So a few of the people I spoke to had already evacuated border areas and others were in Kursk City. I think most of them have congregated in Kursk City now. And again, those who are in the city say that they have plans ready to go. When I was interviewing all of these people, something as well that I will go back to later is that there was a lot of resentment towards the war and to Vladimir Putin overall, which I thought was quite an interesting dynamic to come out of these interviews. So I'll start by running through who I interviewed and what they said. One of the people I spoke to was Sasha, who's a 28-year-old living in Kursk City with her parents. She was one of those people that said that her family already have a route out of the city planned. And to quote her, she said that they could leave at a moment's notice and that they were ready to do what they had to do. She did say, though, that she doesn't want to leave and she would much rather stay and help anyone that might be injured if any fighting does kick off but that she ultimately has to put her parents first and make sure that they're safe. She was really quick to stress to me that we spoke early on Thursday morning and she wanted to make it clear the danger is looming. We've already had three air raids sound just this morning. She also shared the experiences of her family. A lot of them were close to the border and they had fled villages when Ukraine first crossed it. And she said that she'd never felt relief like the moment when she was reunited with her grandparents, her uncles and her aunts. 
Speaking of these evacuations, I also spoke to a man named Vadim, Vadim, who was one of those who sprang into action in these villages as soon as Ukraine crossed the border. He woke up to the sounds of a Ukrainian drone attack in Sotansky district, which is around 50 miles east of Kursk city. He very quickly banded together with others in the area to gather any working cars. He said that they gathered together minibuses and they were just banding together to make sure that they could get everyone out of the way. He said that there was a really strong sense of solidarity between everyone and that kept him going. But ultimately, he was really scared that they might not be able to get everyone out of the crossfire in time. He said that a lack of phone connection made the escape very difficult to coordinate and that cars would often depart half empty, unsure if others were still waiting and that people were left behind. He was definitely overall a leader in this effort. And I was really interested to know how did he manage to keep going under this pressure and how did he manage to keep team focused when they were facing challenges like no phone signal, lack of coordination. And he um, described to me a sort of situation he was in where he had to gather his team in a circle around him and he led them through some sort of deep breathing exercises to keep them going. I then spoke to a 26-year-old who chose to remain anonymous for safety reasons, but in the article we referred to him as Bogdan. He also fled from Ukrainian advances from Glushkovo, which you mentioned earlier. Um, But he said that since the war began, they've grown so accustomed to constant tension and news of the front line shifting closer that what has happened almost felt inevitable to him. And he said to me, Life with shelling and deaths of civilians has been going on for more than two years, so this situation doesn't surprise me. Only the cat was scared when we fled. We've known this was coming. When I asked him about what he thought could be next and what his fears were, he actually said he was worried that Ukraine could penetrate deep inside Russia. As I mentioned a little bit ago, when I was hunting down, trying to track Russians, he'd be willing to talk to me, which was a bit of a challenge, of course. I managed to make contact with a Ukrainian soldier who was part of the invasion. Like Bogdan, he wanted to keep his identity anonymous, but said that the high stakes gamble Ukraine is making by taking the war into Russia was paying off. He said that the commanders had planned everything meticulously and that all was going ahead as they intended. So as I said earlier, one of the most surprising things to come out of my investigation was this general dissatisfaction with authorities and dissatisfaction about what was going on. So the person that stressed this the most in very stark terms was a man named Maxim, who is a shop worker in Kursk City. And he described to me the windows of his supermarket shaking amid Ukrainian attacks, but that his colleagues um, and himself had nowhere to shelter, nowhere to go. They were forced to keep working. He voiced a lot of dissatisfaction that officials had done um, very little to help with this. And to quote him, he said, this is not America. Um, He said that it's something that probably wouldn't happen in the United States. And he actually spoke very positive about the United States in general. And at one point he said, I'm only for Ukraine or the US to free us from this circus with clowns. It's incredibly impossible to fight for justice in Russia. Maxim wasn't the only person I spoke to who expressed dissatisfaction, as well as weariness about the war and, as I said, the country's leadership as a whole. I was really interested in my conversation with Bogdan. Something that he brought up was that he barely ever spoken to someone outside of Russia before, and he was just really curious to know about what we in Britain think about the war and what we think about Russians themselves. And he really wanted to make it clear and he wanted people to know that he loves his homeland and he harbours no hatred towards Ukraine or any other country and that he just wants the war to end. Well, after I'd heard this from Bogdan, I went back to Sasha because I wanted to know, was she feeling any anything similar? So I asked her how the war had impacted her view of her homeland. And when she replied, she made the distinction between homeland and state. She said that she would always love her homeland, but it was that it was her state that had started the war with Ukraine. And she said, war is absolutely unacceptable. War is death. Only God can take away a person's life and another person has no right to do so under any circumstances. Ah, fascinating stuff. There's so many questions and quite a lot of mixed messages there, really. I mean, the chap you're calling Bogdan, he says he was expecting it expecting you know, trouble and violence and the war war to arrive but then 
I, any indication at all? Did he then join the dots at all and say, offer any comment about why he thought this trouble was heading in his direction? And equally, Maxim talking about the circus of clowns, a very colourful expression. Mm, Again, yeah. and, he, and he says he, you know, he's, he's warm to the United States and, and what have you, but any indication that, that, that he tried to do anything? And finally, Sasha talking about that difference between homeland and state. It's inter- an interesting sort of intellectual exercise to pass the two, but of course, mm-hmm. that, that you, it's not. It's the same thing. Did he, any of them take that thought far enough and direct critique of Putin and the Kremlin and the way things were, were running there? Well, to start with what you said about Bogdan, he's just been living on the border area for so long and him and his family have been watching the tension escalate and he said it was his father himself who had been watching the news very closely and just had a sense that things weren't going to go away anytime soon. For Maxim, those were the main things he said. A lot of support for Ukraine in the US and yeah, you're right, this idea of the circus with clowns, it it was really shocking to hear that from someone in Russia that they would be um, that outspoken. I think he just had the feeling that he was trapped without a voice and he didn't really feel like he had much control politically or any ability to speak out about anything. Because as we know, it's been very difficult for anyone in Russia to say that they have issues with the war and to say that they are against any fighting. And Sasha, yeah, I, I think you're right. It is a really interesting concept, the idea of homeland and state being separate. It was, again... Bogdan touched upon that because he said that he loves his country. He said that he's been there, he's been educated there, he's worked there, he's poured all of his love into this place. But again, he saw officials and leadership as a different part of the country, really. Amazing stuff, Rodi. Thanks so much for that. Please, please do keep us in touch with uh, with your work. Uh, don't be a stranger. Been away far too long. We need Great. to uh, get you. you and your journalism back on here. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Turning now to Brussels, Joe, put the croissant down. You've reported that President Zelensky has warned our new Prime Minister here, Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, that there are no, quote, no holidays in war, uh, whilst also calling for British weapons deliveries to be accelerated. What have you been looking at, Joe? Oh, hi, folks. I hope you're all well. Yeah, I've been looking at a magnitude of things. I think I'll just briefly cover a few stories in the diplomatic political front before we get into that juicier content. So first of all, Nehandra Modi, the Indian Prime Minister, is going to visit Ukraine. That's according to the Indian Foreign Minister Ministry. We're going to get more details on that trip later, but it'll be the first uh, visit by Modi to Ukraine since the beginning of the full-scale invasion. You'll remember last month he visited Russia and held various talks with Vladimir Putin. Zelensky and Modi have met previously on the edges of a G7 summit in Italy. And during the war and the invasion, Modi has always spoken about this need for dialogue and diplomacy. So India has been calling for this diplomatic solution to end the war. It's distanced itself from criticising Putin's invasion outright. And has basically, India has been one of the countries that is profiting from the West's decision to turn its back on Moscow. So India buys a lot of crude oil from Russia, processes it, and then exports it out again. And then we've got a story involving Elon Musk and Ramzan Kadyrov. So it sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. But as many of you will be aware, Kadarov, the Chechen warlord, over the weekend shared a video of himself driving a Tesla Cybertruck with a machine gun mounted in its rear compartment. And he thanked Musk, the owner of X, for sending him the vehicle. So he said, uh, this is Kadarov, said, Elon, thank you. Come to Grozny. I will receive you as my most dearest guest, Kadarov said, before saying that the truck was destined for the battlefield in Ukraine. This revelation is obviously problematic for various reasons. Kadarov is under swaves of western sanctions for his role in the invasion so how on earth is he he getting hold of this car this vehicle which is packed for the western tech which most of us would consider to be dual use in terms of its military and civilian application so given that detail it's fair to ask elon musk and tesla how did this happen but here's what musk had to say are you seriously so i'm quoting elon musk so retarded that you think I donated a cyber truck to a Russian general? Yet another example of how the legacy media lies, Musk added. Yeah, I'm not sure why his rant about legacy media came, given that he was responding on X Twitter to a series of social media posts sharing Kadarov's Telegram video. That's hardly legacy media <laughs> lies, but you know, um, that's Elon Musk, everyone. Joe, are we legacy media? I get, I get, I'm losing track of what I am these days. I'm supposed to be so many different colours and flags and all the rest of it. Am I now legacy media? I guess so. We're definitely mainstream media, aren't we? Uh, but yeah, God, that, yeah, who knows, Dom? That's the question that's probably above our pay grades. 
And then, yeah, on to the last diplomatic story before I go into Britain, Storm Shadow and Ukraine. The reports over the weekend that Germany has frozen its military aid to Ukraine because of a domestic budgetary crisis. So according to Frankfurter Allgemeine newspaper, Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor, has told his defence minister that there will be no money available for future military aid to Kyiv. So this comes after Boris Pistorius, the defence minister, had written up a wish list of around €4 billion, that's £3.4 billion, to basically continue aiding Ukraine. So what's this about? This is not about Germany suspending aid as of now. It's a budgetary sort of paperwork issue. So Germany has pledged up to €8 billion in aid this year and it's going to deliver that so it's no not affecting basically agreed aid and then you have basically a leaked budget the version of a leaked budget which came out in the sort of media last month i think it was saying that germany will drop about half of that amount so three to four billion euros next year that's according to this leaked version and then so all of the reports that germany is pulling aid were met by these rumors being quashed basically saying look Germ- and then a friend of mine, Sebastian Fischer, who's now, he's, I met him in Brussels, but he's now the German Foreign Ministry spokesman, said that rumours that Germany stops its support to Ukraine are wrong. We stand with Ukraine and will support Ukraine as long as it takes. So basically, this is a budgetary issue that needs to be ironed out because Germany is lacking funds for various reasons. But it has said it could go to those different ways it could raise money, not just out of taxation from Germans. And yeah, I believe you've got questions on Well, yeah, I mean, you partially answered it there. Thanks, Joe. I was going to ask how much of this is just domestic stuff, given the the rise of the AFD and other uh, far right groups in and parties in Germany. What, can you remind us when the next elections are? What kind of political, domestic political pressure Schultz is under? Because if this is just budgetary, as you say, then that that doesn't normally have to happen in public and be all the fanfare and all that kind of stuff. I just wondered if there was more to it of a domestic flavour. Yeah, so elections next year, September 28, 2025. But I, I, so look, I'm not completely tuned in on this, but my reading of it is it actually it literally is the current German coalition government has basically overspent because of various things such as transitioning away from Russian fossil fuels, COVID, post-COVID bills, et cetera, et cetera. And written into the German constitution is this thing called a debt break, which basically means that the finance ministry cannot go into huge overspends, which means they've got to then basically pull back funds and claw back funds from elsewhere to balance their books. And Ukraine seems to be one of the areas that is affected because Olaf Scholz had previously said that the debt break applies, but it doesn't apply to his sort of foreign policy priorities, mainly being Ukraine. So it's an, it's an interesting row, and I'm sure it will heat up with some elements of the sort of the AFD far right row. German angry at the fact that they're being charged more because they've had to transition away from Russian fossil fuels, etc. So yeah, fascinating one to keep watching. But I literally do think at the moment we're looking at a story where it's about pencil pushers working out how to factor in a number into a document. Fair enough. Thank you for that. Now, Storm Shadow, and I just I was thinking about this when we were discussing what we we're going to chat about today. I mean, it was only a, a few short months ago when we journalist fraternity here in in London were speaking to MOD saying, "Come on." Tell us you've got this. You've given storm shadows to Ukraine, and it was a super duper big secret, and even beyond the point of parody almost. And now another red line that's been crossed, supposed red line that's been crossed, with no real reaction from Russia, and it's almost it's common parlance. We're now talking about it every day. I just have to keep reminding myself how far and how fast things are moving, and stuff that you take you you think is is immovable now, just give it a few weeks, and it could be a very very different situation but you've been looking at another storm shadow the latest storm shadow story joe what can you tell us here so last week president zelensky had a meeting with his sort of close war cabinet and he said that he had tasked both of the ukrainian foreign ministries and and defense ministry with basically convincing ukraine's western partners to allow deep strikes inside russia with western missiles we know that the main missiles they're talking about are Storm Shadow and Scout PG, the Storm Shadow's French sister, donated by Britain and France, funny enough, and then the Attackham's ballistic missile donated by America. So over the weekend, I received what I felt was the most comprehensive brief about Ukraine's request to Britain to end the limits on firing Storm Shadow into Russia. So look, we've known about the request for a long time. I think it was last month. There was a bit of confusion at the NATO summit. So Keir Starmer had sort of suggested maybe we we would allow those strikes in. 
President Zelensky and went on social media and said, oh, we thank you for that decision. And then it turned out that that decision hadn't been made. So what was interesting, with thanks to Mikhailo Podolak, who's a sort of senior advisor to Zelensky, and some good people at Ukraine's Ministry of Defence, I've been able to unpick their exact reasoning and what they're saying in meetings with British officials. So basically, in their pitch, the Ukrainians are outlining what they can hit, how they can hit it, and why it's important for them to hit it. And the most important point that they are making to the Brits saying, look, this will, and I quote Mikhailo Podolak here, it will turn the tide of war. So Mr. Podolak was telling me, look, undoubtedly, Ukraine urgently needs our British partners to authorise the use of storm shadow cruise missiles to strike Russian territory. He detailed how the Ukrainian Air Force would hit command posts, cruise missile storage depots and military airfields located near the Ukrainian border. And he said they would be targeted in systematic and large scale strikes. So one of those air bases, so normally the Ukrainians are reticent to actually discuss their targets, but they were kind enough to put some briefing together for me. And one of the, those targets was outlined as the Lipesk airbase. You all remember this most recently as the airbase targeted by Kyiv with a wave of drones, which Ukrainian officials said, um, I believe last week now, destroyed 700 Russian glide bombs. Look, and, it, and that airfield is about 200 miles away from the Ukrainian border near the Russian Kursk region, where we know that Ukraine is staging this sort of audacious counterattack onto Russian soil. And so Mr. Podolak, though, now outlining why storm shadow is so important. He said, look, Ukraine has already demonstrated its ability to effectively destroy such targets, such strikes being carried out using Ukraine's assisting capabilities, speaking about drones, and they are very complex and time-consuming operations. If Ukraine is able to use storm shadow missiles in such operations, the quality and number of strikes could increase significantly, and the systematic and large-scale strikes are one of the keys to finally turning the tide of war in favour of the democratic pro-Ukrainian coalition. So he's basically saying, look, we can do all of these jobs, but these drone waves, which sometimes involve up to 100 drones at a time, take immense planning, sort of huge coordination efforts, and it's a lot more difficult than simply loading up a missile, pre-programming its target, and hopefully firing it off. So what do we know about storm shadows? They can hit targets about 190 miles away, and they come with modern technologies that could basically become crucial in disrupting the Kremlin's war machine inside Ukraine. Mainly, Mr. Podolak was speaking about its bunker-busting warhead, so this is what's known as the brooch. It's a sort of penetrating warhead that is designed to go into specifically and specially reinforced shelters housing Russian aircraft and munitions. It can also fly low to the ground, so basically skirting the terrain, concealing itself from enemy radar coverage, making it harder for Russian air defence systems to target. So as Tom added, that allowing the use of storm shadows on the territory of Russian Federation will significantly slow down and complicate Russian logistics and force Russia to withdraw its aircraft to even more remote airfields. He said that Storm Shadow wouldn't just be used in singular attacks. He described how they could be used with other means of destruction. And then he said, look, by the way, as already is clear from the course of the current war, Russia understands only significant force and losses. So what is the challenges being faced by Britain and other countries that are involved in decisions over long range Missiles. So, look, Kyiv has requested both Britain and France to drop these re restrictions. Mr. Zelensky has also repeatedly asked Washington for American donated attackums to be used in a similar way. So, from my understanding, speaking to sources in the defence realm and people involved, London, Paris, and Rome have all got to sign off on any decision over storm shadow. That's because manufacturers based in their countries all play a role in building these things. But a British defence source said, look, that's not really told me, not told me, that's not really the main problem. And I know um, Rachel, one of our listeners, is was asking about this, we'd go into more detail. So from what I understand, the US has basically become the real stumbling block because it is blocking, and this is a, say, from a defence source I've been speaking to, a key enabling requirement for launching Storm Shadow into Russia. So basically, there is a part of the launch process or the immediate process before that or after that that requires a bit of US technology that the US is not accepting being used so far. So we could actually get a British decision, could get a French decision, could get an Italian decision, but it also requires this American decision. Look, I'm trying to work out what this enabler is. I don't know. It's top secret. So it's a case of asking everyone I can think of to reveal it. And it's also worth remembering in this discussion that Germany has refused to hand over Taurus cruise missiles, which could also be used. So European nations are hesitant to move without an agreement from the US because it 
basically for the military reasons of that enabler, but also there's diplomatic and military cover for any decision. Last week, the Americans said, look, they're worried about escalation. This is what the UK have said. They said there is no change in the UK's position. We've been providing military aid to support Ukraine's clear right of self-defense against Russia's illegal attacks in accordance with international humanitarian law. We are clear that equipment provided by the UK is intended for the defense of Ukraine. But before moving on to the next segment on Zelensky and his comments about Britain, I think we should have a sort of short debate and bring Dom in to ask him your thoughts on Storm Shadow and how the Ukrainians used to plan them, how to pl- uh, plan to use them, sorry. Well, I think we, we've seen what they'd like to do with it. We saw the sinking or the double hit, double tap on that submarine, whatever it's called, the Rostov, I think, that the Kilo class, I believe, uh, Russian submarine in Sevastopol and other suspected storm shadow attacks as well. I just think the whole issue of defence sovereignty is fascinating now, this idea that if you're going to have to defer to other countries who supply some, maybe a a large minority or the majority of the parts in certain weapons, you've got to go and ask their permission before you can use it. I mean, people are going to be looking at this with great interest. And quite frankly, if I was in the position to do so, I would be investing in Ukraine's domestic weapons manufacturers right now because they're probably taking the lesson from this that like, right, lads, we need to be completely sovereign on this stuff. We cannot go around this boy again of having to ask permission from X, Y and Z every time we want to go and do something. Let's build all these things ourselves. So if you want to invest in micro electronics and all that kind of clever gizmos, I suggest we all pile in, forget Bitcoin, we all pile into, uh, or fine wine, uh, all pile into uh, Ukraine's domestic weapons manufacturers. But Joe, yes, quickly, a comment on Zelensky and Keir Starmer and then we need to uh, go and have a chat with our guys from GP now. Yeah, so these comments about storm shadows have been followed by Vladimir Zelensky warning to Keir Starmer that there are no holidays in war. Basically, as he called for British weapons to be deliveries to be accelerated. He was basically saying, Zelensky, this is our guys are doing great on all fronts. However, there is a need for faster deliveries of supplies from our partners. We strongly ask for this. There are no vacations or holidays in war. Decisions are needed. As it is timely logistics, as is timely logistics for the announced aid packages. I especially address this to the US, UK and France. That comes after. So this was on Sunday's evening announcements by Zelensky. The Saturday evening announcement basically had him complaining about British support slowing down. And this is what he had to say. Unfortunately, the situation has slowed down recently. He said referring to UK military assistance. We will discuss how to fix this because the long range capabilities are vital for us. The whole world sees how effective Ukrainians are and how our entire nation defends its independence. He added, long-range capabilities are the answer to the most critical strategic questions of this war. So yeah, Zelensky's not all, not only sanctioned a bit of an offensive in Kursk, he's also trying to rattle the halls and the corridors of Downing Street into being a bit more proactive with its support for Ukraine. I'm not entirely sure why he's singled out Britain so much. Obviously, maybe not the time to be singling out Germany when there's reports of no aid coming from Berlin. But yeah, maybe Zelensky actually feels like Keir Starmer is right on the verge of sanctioning the storm shadow U-turn, essentially, that had been maintained after the Conservative government swap over to Labour. But yeah, that's just me speculating. I'm not entirely sure, but it's interesting why it could be happening. Thanks, Joe. I mean, for my mind, and we'll have to wait for the brains of the outfit on the politics front to come back, come back tomorrow. But I reckon, why is Zelensky criticising Britain or, or putting the focus on storm shadow and, and britain here i would have yeah i'm guessing i would have thought it's maybe something to do with the political situation in the u.s i.e i would imagine ukraine thinks that they'll be it would be more favorable to them if kamala harris was in the white house next year rather than donald trump and she has momentum in the polls at the moment i wonder if Zelensky's is thinking we let's just not rock that let's not put that question to them and put her on the spot which might dent her momentum at the moment i don't know but we should we will wait and see but clearly they want to move on the tackums as well Now then, delighted to welcome back to the pod 
GP now. We've got Rob in Singapore. I mean, Craig, what a, what a global global podcast this is. We've got Rob in, in Singapore and Spencer in San Diego. Spencer, you've, you've got up really early and you've been waiting for ages. So I really do appreciate you you hanging on there. Rob, it's been a while since we had you, you on the pod. Could you reintroduce GP now, please, to our listeners? Update us on your work this year and what service you, that you offer to Ukrainians, both in and out of the country and in the occupied territories. Oh, hi, Dom. It's good to reconnect, my friend. It's been a while. I think last time we spoke was back on November 16 last year. Yes, PNOW is a telehealth platform that we established seven years ago. We're focused on delivering virtual care for the most vulnerable, particularly health equity and disaster relief programs. We ran a number of projects in Australia and mainly in the Asia-Pacific region, Malaysia, Indonesia, and so forth. We're based out of Singapore. And in February 2022, my gosh, it's a lifetime ago, we got together and back by Amazon Web Services, we crafted a solution to deliver Ukrainian doctors into Ukraine, including occupied territory across Europe and around the world. And that, a lot of that was down to Dr. Ilyashenko at the Obery Clinic, who you were kind enough to meet when you went to visit key for the anniversary back in February and thank you for making the time to join with him. Yeah, as we, we, we have 75 Ukrainian doctors available online in the cloud. Uh, we call it the hospital in the cloud, as you dubbed it on our first call. We have 12 in Ukraine and 63 mainly mums who were forced to leave at the start of the war and then unable to practice in the countries to which they've been located. And they deliver free medical advice, comfort and care for their fellow citizens. And one of the big developments, Dom, since we last spoke is we've truly gone global, my friend. We're now operating in 56 countries around the world. And I was stunned. We, we did a report for, for the Rotary International event recently. We've done over 17,000 free consultations. A bulk of those consultations are in Ukraine, then Poland is behind that, and then spread across Europe, as I say, UK, North America. But we even have Ukrainian patients in Brazil, in Rwanda, in Uganda, Indonesia, Vietnam, and even one in China. So we're very proud of that development since we, and we're up to about 12,000 families, about 5,000 children. Our doctors are a, a very eclectic, broad range of skills from primary care through to psychologists, oncologists, paediatricians, um, and even a veterinarian, which um, we talked about last time. There's a lot of pets seriously dealing with the, the, the trauma and fatigue of um, relocation. The service has morphed since we spoke. Uh, in the acute stage, when there was this massive flood of people relocating with their families all over Europe mainly. Settling down and getting access to primary health care and prescriptions was a real challenge, but we're doing many more longer consultations. Most of them are hours, some even two hours long. And that's because we've seen a rise in just the fatigue of war and the mental health challenges that come with that and a drop off in the short primary care sessions. So we're very proud. And I want to thank you, Don, personally. Yeah, it, we're not particularly newsworthy. We, when the Okmadit Children's Hospital gets, uh, gets attacked, it's front page news and we're operating in the background. And Mr. Putin and his boys have, dis I think now the count is maybe 1,853 clinics and hospitals have been damaged and destroyed. And we've been running 24 by 7 now since 20, the start of April after we did testing in 2022. We've done delivered 3,000 hours and we've had zero downtime. So it's what's going really well. The other good news is any of the listeners, the Ukraine, the latest listeners from last year may recall the young girl, Anastasia, who was contacted us back in September 2022 with chondral chordoma, which is life-threatening throat and neck cancer. It's an incredible fairy tale story. We scoured the world and we finished up thanks to Professor Pearl and his team at Leiden Medical University. She got treated back three rounds of surgery back at the start of 2023. And um, the third round was actually on the 24th of February. And she was doing really well. Yaroslava husband was, her fiance was discharged and they got married and everything was going well. But 
Unfortunately, in February this year, she had a relapse and she was given a month or maybe two, but somehow Professor Pearl and his team went back in. And I know a lot of people want to know how she's doing. Well, Yaroslav has been given, especially dispensation, he's been discharged to care for his young bride and, uh, and they're, they're enjoying life together. What's not going well for us at the moment, your previous speaker mentioned taking ground. Although the demand for our service is increasing, we have a steady stream of 10, 15 patients registering every day, fundraising the support with issues that have occurred around the world since we last spoke. Ukraine is no longer on the front page and funding our operating costs has been really, really difficult. Just so everybody knows, we pay our doctors 10 euros for every family they help every session. And we have about $2,000 in operating costs, which this year, alas, we are now completely on our own, our service providers. We now have, have effectively doubled our operating costs from $2,000 a month to $4,000 a month, which comes out of the pocket of the doctors that we pay. So we're really struggling. It's our own war of attrition. We're really struggling to keep the lights on and pay the team. And, and so that's caused a lot of fatigue. And, and frankly, the only support we had last year really was from organizations like Credit Union Relief Fund. But it was your audience who have been magnificent. They saved us last year and we have about a thousand dollars in prescriptions that subscriptions that come in at the still even now, but we're hoping to turn the tide. So on a positive note, thanks for keeping us alive. About a couple of months ago, we had a young girl. So Mike Parker, CEO of Bioparcel in the UK. We have a lot of followers on LinkedIn. He had a young lady in Kharkiv who was in a desperate situation with her young baby. Bombs going off and missiles in the distance and not that far. A lot of problems. And as I mentioned, the mental health challenges have really soared with the fatigue of war. And Mike pulled together a team, and including Ruslan Alikparov, who's part of our Pi Foundation, our charity, uh, representing Ukraine uh, from direct help. And we got the, the call at 3.35 in the morning, and uh, within an hour, Tanya was on a call with her, assuring her of support. And then we got uh, Valentina Kuzmik, one of our incredible psychologists, to connect with her and, and pull her back from the edge. And... It's a segue, Dom, into retired Major Spencer Cash. But Spencer's been our biggest champion. He's just returned from Kharkiv, and perhaps I'll hand over to Spencer to say a few words about his time in Ukraine. Yeah, please do. Spencer, thanks so much for getting up so early or staying up so late. You were recently in Kharkiv seeing some of the people that GP now has helped. What did you see out there? Uh, Dom, thank you for having me back and allowing me to share my about my recent trip to Ukraine. Uh, during this visit, my travel guide and brother from a Ukrainian mother, Ruslan, and I drove in two vehicles. They were purchased in Europe and were donated to the municipality of Kharkiv for evacuation. I spent a lot of time on the road and saw much more of the country than I did previously. One of the things I noticed is that there were a lot less fighting age males in the cities and much more graves and ve of veterans in the cemeteries. Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine has gone on for over two and a half years, and there's not one Ukrainian that has escaped being personally and individually affected by Russian war crimes. What I observed on this visit was that the Ukrainian people have long ago made a decision to live their lives in spite of Russia's nearly constant attempts to kill them through aerial barbarism. During my three-week visit to Ukraine, I spent five days in Kharkiv under some pretty intense uh, periods of shelling. Uh, this time frame was just as F-16s had entered the fight and before the start of the Kursk offensive. Ruslan and I drove into Kharkiv late one night. The city was in total darkness and under an air attack alert. On the first night, I fell asleep around 2 a.m. in Ruslan's daughter's bed. At 5.30 a.m., boom, the first round of indirect fire hit close. The explosion was not as large as a missile or glide bomb. It was something smaller, a drone maybe. Throughout my five days in Kharkiv, we were under nearly continuous air alerts. One special thing that I got to do in Kharkiv was to visit Arena a patient of GP now and resident of the city. Arena is a 20-something-year-old mother of a two-year-old daughter. Last winter, when the price of utilities and the cost of providing for her child got too high, she took out short-term payday type of loans to get by. 
By early summer, her ability to pay back those loans had evaporated. She had then made a plan to jump off her five-story building with her daughter to escape the troubles of her life. As an ambassador for GP Now, I haven't engaged with any of the thousands of patients that they have provided clinical care to. But Irina was different. In her darkest moments, she reached out to me and a few other kind souls to ask for help. Rob and Mike assembled a team to provide Irina with psychological care and help her address her financial challenges that caused the suicidal ideation. I went to Irina's home. I climbed the five flights of stairs to her apartment and visited with her in her kitchen as her daughter slept peacefully in the next room. Let me say it was one of the greatest rewards as a humanitarian and GP Now ambassador to meet a patient that crisis care that the crisis care service had saved. I was able to share with her directly about the numerous people which could which cared about her and her daughter's well-being. After five days of Russian shelling, it was time for me to return to Kyiv. The layers and depth of trauma the Ukrainian people have endured over the past two and a half years is unimaginable. Having been involved in six wars over the course of my life, I can unequivocally state Ukraine is by far the worst one with the most evil enemy. Thank you for allowing me to share. Thanks, Spencer. Rob, if I could come to you quickly, please, for, uh, for your final thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I just want to say a big, big thank you again to, to you, to Team Telegraph, and to the incredible Ukraine, the latest audience. Um, we are in dire straits. And if I can ask the audience, if you can please consider visiting either www.gpnow.net or the pifoundation.org, which is our US-based 501c3 charity. That's pii-foundation.org, and, and make a contribution. We get lumpy donations, thanks to you from last year. What we actually need is stability. And if you could consider making a, a smaller donation, even one dollar or one pound or one euro a month uh, or, or, or ten dollars, but it, at least we've got the consistency and the stability to keep the service going. And I know we're out of time, Dom. I just want to say I love you, brother. Your quality, your class, and you're doing an incredible job. And we're all part of a big team that is trying to make a change to help the great nation of Ukraine. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To support our work and stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis, and dispatches from the ground, please subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just one pound at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our foreign affairs newsletter, bringing stories from our award winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We also do the same for other breaking international stories. You can listen to this conversation live at 1 pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app and leave us a review as it helps others find the show. Please also share it with those who may not be aware we exist. As the disinformation war ramps up, we are relying on your support more than ever. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do continue to read every message. You can also contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Rachel Porter. Executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.